Slate Money is sponsored this week by SAP Business AI. We've got some bad news. It won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. It will identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. It will automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. It's basically something that allows you to get ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hello! We'll be right back. Welcome to Money Talks. We'll take a quick break and be back money. in a second. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios, and today... I want to talk about my favorite subject in the world, which is office to residential conversions. And I have the perfect person to talk about it with, Grace Rao. Grace, welcome. Who are you? Felix, thank you for having me. I'm Grace Rao. I am the executive director of an organization called the Five Borough Institute. And we are a New York City public policy think tank that launched in 2022 to advance innovative public policy ideas and solutions to tackle big challenges facing New York City. So we're going to talk about this whole subject more generally, but it does seem that the natural place to start if you are into this whole concept of converting offices to homes would be New York. And New York has been doing this for a long time, right? Right. We on the one hand, have a ton of experience with office to residential conversions. And on the other, we actually have all sorts of limitations in place that prevent us as a city right now from actually doing this on a really broad scale. Give me a little bit of history and context here. When did this start and why did it start? Conversions generally. Yeah. I mean, our best example really is in lower Manhattan. So pre 9-11, go back to um, the early 1990s, a recession that hit New York, really the whole country starting in the late 80s, a ton of people lost their jobs. And we saw a big spike in office vacancies in lower Manhattan. And basically, the city of New York said, we need to do something about it. It started under Mayor Dinkins. It was continued under Mayor Giuliani. But essentially, there was a huge effort underway to take all of this empty office space. Remember, back then, Wall Street in lower Manhattan was essentially a place that people went to to work exclusively. And they said, we need to take some of these empty office buildings and turn them into apartments Otherwise, this neighborhood is going to become obsolete. And they instituted uh, some property tax incentives that really spurred a lot of that development. And it led to a wave of conversions. So the the incentives there, the reasons why you'd want to do it originally, back when it first started, were we don't want the financial district to become a ghost town. There were a few people working And if we bring people in to live there, then it becomes a much more 24-hour neighborhood. It has life in the evenings. And it, you know, helps to create housing, which is something New York always needs. So all of this seemed like a good idea. And then it was very much helped along by the fact that there were a whole bunch of, like, in office terms, slightly crappy pre-war buildings that like really no one wanted to rent his offices anymore, but that had small enough floor plates that they were quite easy to turn into apartments. Right. So so Lower Manhattan has a distinct advantage as a neighborhood in this conversation about conversions for, for the point that you raise, right? These older buildings, they had much smaller floor plates, as they say, right? Like they're narrower, tall buildings. The windows, by and large, you could lift yourself, right? These are not kind of what we think of as like these big behemoth office buildings that lurk along 6th Avenue in Midtown. These are very different types of buildings. They were a lot easier to convert by and large. Although a lot of people in the real estate industry say that, you know, without those property tax incentives on the table in the 90s, we wouldn't have seen the level of conversions that we saw. There were about uh, close to 13,000 apartments that were converted from office space into homes in lower Manhattan that were directly connected to that property tax incentive program. And at the same time, partly because of property tax incentives and partly because, like, New York is 
Lake all says he's a living thing and it changes and it grows. Over time, Lower Manhattan did start building residential buildings from scratch, just from the ground up. And so you could sort of see the two of them side by side. What do you see when you compare the converted buildings to the built for purpose buildings? Would any normal per- person always prefer to live in a building that was actually built to be a place where someone lives? So it depends. Probably the short answer is yes. It's what's well, just more familiar, right? Like it's a layout in a built for purpose building. It's a layout that probably you and I are familiar with in, in terms of walking into an apartment and having lots of light uh, and not that deep of an apartment. So I, I can tell you, I have a friend who lived in a, a converted office a building into apartments uh, in lower Manhattan. And her apartment was narrow and deep, deep, deep. So it was like a long, deep rectangle. I think it was probably technically listed as a studio apartment. But that it was had, huge. Right, that had like, huge depth. Huge amounts of like pointless space. And you're like, what am I meant to do with all of this Right, space? she had a young child. They would ride their tricycle around the apartment. I mean, it worked for them, but it was a long and narrow space. And then what we commonly see in some of these conversions are interior offices, quote. right? So, I, so I, quote, I, I can quote, feel the scare quote. quotes here. <laughs> it's not a bedroom, people. It's an interior office, it's, wink, wink. Right. Yeah. It's an interior office. So actually, we highlighted, we, we did a report this fall on conversions and this new housing idea that we have related to them. But we, in our report, we put in a floor plan for one of these lower Manhattan apartments that was um, made, created through a conversion. And it is a studio apartment with two in-home offices, which are essentially, you know, windowless alcoves that are deep into the recesses of this apartment. Anyone who's looking at that floor plan and lives in New York knows that somebody is living in those in-home offices. Those in-home offices are going to have beds in them. They are going to have beds in them, although actually under current regulations, you cannot have a bathroom or a closet in an in-home office. So we have we as a city and state have tried to dissuade people from turning those rooms into bedrooms. But we know that space is scarce. Or housing costs a fortune in the city. And so people are living in those spaces. I, I would be shocked if anyone was renting an apartment like that as a true studio. New York City median rents, by some large margin now, the most expensive in the country. We've we've long since pulled away from San Francisco. The median one bedroom in the city is well over four thousand dollars. In Manhattan it's more even than that and the bit, you know, Brownstone Brooklyn. So clearly People are desperate for space and they're going to be happy if they can find a place with space and a room and a bed to, to sleep in it. Tell me a little bit about why why is it that the city and the state have historically been so reluctant to encourage or allow people to live in that way, in a windowless bedroom? Oh, well, I mean, the history in New York of housing, it, uh, you immediately – come face to face with kind of our history with tenements and overcrowding in substandard living conditions. So, you know, at the turn of the early 20th century, you know, you can go visit the tenement, incredible tenement museum on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and go visit these sort of tiny warrens of apartments where families were crowded into small spaces. Many of those early homes lacked proper, you know, ventilation and access to light and air, things that we don't necessarily take for granted, but are are really baked into our modern day housing code. So there was a, a lot of our housing regulations really are are and were a response to sub to substandard housing from the tenement era. And then additionally, we had in New York City really broad existence of what are known as SROs, single room occupancy units, where people can rent an individual bedroom. Oftentimes, you might be able to rent it for a week or a month, but sort of short term, um, you didn't need to have a huge security deposit. You didn't need to pay a broker's fee um, the way you do now or first and last month's rent. You could go with your money for the week and have you know sort of a safe and secure room and use a bathroom down the hall and there might be a shared kitchen. 
And and those were really common across New York. And they ran the gamut from places that really catered to people who were like just scrounging together to pay that weekly rent. And then there were also kind of like fancier versions of those rooming houses, places like the Barbizon that catered to women so that when young women were trying to convince their parents, I'm going to go to New York and make my way in the world. They could say, don't worry, I'm going to live, you know, with just a group of women at an all women's boarding house, places like the Barbizon, which housed, um, you know, writers like Sylvia Plath and Joan Didion and were these kind of like iconic places. But really, uh, around the 1950s, 1960s, there was growing concern about a lot of those single room occupancy units and developments. People were worried they were attracting, again, in air quotes, sort of the wrong type of people, people on the margins, people who might have problems or might be a blight on a neighborhood. And there was a real effort underway to to shut them down and phase them out. And so we as a city pretty deliberately made it essentially really difficult for SROs to exist and all but blocked them, new ones, from opening. And we lost, as a result, a really important housing source for the city and one that was incredibly affordable to so many people. And that's been largely wiped out. We have to take a break, but we'll be back after this. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, Evolve faster and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. So given these like slightly awkward floor plates, and given the fact that that process that you're talking about of the eradication of the SROs did sort of take out a large chunk of the sort of bottom end of the housing market in New York. The obvious natural place to go here is to say, well, if we're back in this world of office to residential conversions today, which we are because of, you know, the pandemic, people are working from home, more office demand is way down. People don't want to go into the old offices anymore. We're in a very similar place to where we were, I guess, back in the 80s or early 90s. Given those two things, what you would really want, what you would really like would be for new office to residential conversions to kind of take the place of those old SROs and create you know, more affordable housing for um, the people who've been really priced out of New York. That would be great. But like, it doesn't really pencil out, right? Well, I think it can pencil out. I mean, right now, there are, there are a bunch of regulatory hurdles blocking something like that from happening. And, and what you're describing is essentially an idea that our organization, the Five Borough Institute, put on the table in our most recent housing report, where we put together a plan for a pilot program that we're calling flexible co-living that we want the city to pursue. Wait, did Adam Newman just come into the studio here? <laughs> flexible co-living? That's, this is this is totally like a, a tech bro concept, right? Well, there are probably some I don't want to make to say that there are any parallels to anything in the Adam Newman world, but the the concept of people living together and sharing common amenities like living rooms, bathrooms, kitchens, I think yes, does borrow a bit from sort of the WeWork concept. But the 
the idea here is we have these two challenges facing New York and not just New York. This is this is something that cities across the country are are grappling with. Right. Like we have this housing crisis and an affordability crisis. And then we have all of this vacant office space and the vacant office space should be an opportunity to address the housing crisis. But there are all sorts of challenges with making creating affordable housing through conversions. So our plan essentially calls for like a modern day dorm style setup for single adults where you could rent an individual bedroom and then have shared, you know, kitchens, bathrooms and living rooms. And when we look at co-living nationally, there is about a 30 percent reduction on average in rent costs for co-living units versus a traditional apartment. So when we're starting to pencil this stuff out, that starts to look really appealing for a potential tenant. And then when we consulted with people in the real estate world and developers on sort of the costs of conversions for our plan versus a traditional conversion, we also saw some real cost savings potential. Conceptually speaking, when I think about an office to residential conversion and I think about what is the difference between an office tower and an apartment tower, put the floor plate question to one side for the minute. The other big difference for me is that office buildings, you know, have the amenities like the kitchens, the bathrooms and everything. They're all just clustered towards the core. And you can, if you need to go to the kitchen or to the bathroom, you can walk over to the core of the building and do what you need to do and then go back to your office. With apartment buildings, because they're much more split up, everyone needs their own kitchen. Everyone needs their own bathroom. You need a whole bunch of like rises and plumbing and stuff that just were never built into these office buildings. And I'm going to just assume in general that if you do a conversion where you end up putting a whole bunch of plumbing into every single apartment, that's just going to be incredibly expensive to put all of that plumbing into that building. Right. So that's cost savings number one with this sort of modern day dorm style flexible co-living plan is that you keep the existing plumbing infrastructure in place. You keep those, you know, sort of centralized kitchens and bathrooms that exist for offices. You obviously build them out a bit, right? You'd need to have showers, things like that. But you're not undertaking some massive renovation to spread the plumbing infrastructure across every corner of the floor plate. And that's a huge cost savings and time savings and time and the development world is cost savings if you can speed up the amount of time it takes to get a tenant in who's starting to pay rent. So that's one advantage of the the flexible co-living and that brings the costs down. But does it, like you say it's cheaper but still, I mean, it's really not that cheap, right? I mean, especially compared to the idea of like, you know, if I have a empty piece of land in a suburb somewhere and I just want to build a house, I could probably still build that house for less dollars per square foot than converting existing square footage in, a, in an office building. That may be completely true, but we don't have that much um, <laughs> sort of vacant, empty land. I'm, I'm envisioning sort of like a green field in the suburbs, um, which well, is well, there's a, green fields in bit, the Upper West Side. Yeah, you know, they're, just, they're few and far between in the heart of New York City. But but on the cost front, I just want to talk about the second major cost savings with flexible co-living versus a traditional conversion. If you right now do a traditional conversion, every bedroom in the unit and living rooms need to have window access. They need to have an exterior window. And so what is happening right now is that developers who have a building that they say, okay, we want to convert this or a conversion that's underway, they are literally drilling a core, like a giant hole through the center of the building. In some cases, they're drilling two of them to create light wells that allow for natural light to come in. Now, anyone who's been in a in a building that has sort of a, a small interior courtyard knows that interior light is, you know, you might crane your neck up and like maybe you see a little patch of sky. Um, you're, you, you know, you're often looking at sort of somebody else's window. But right now to meet uh, the letter of the law, that is required. What we're calling for in this flexible co-living model is for the use of interior windows so that some bedrooms might have exterior windows, but some might be more in the interior of an office floor plan plate and have 
a window that has gives you access to natural light, but at a remove. So, yeah, this is um, something that I think everyone who has ever worked in an office building is familiar with. There are two different types of office. There are the offices on the perimeter of the building, and you get the window and the view. And then there's some kind of open space normally. And then between that open space and the core is another row of offices for like the slightly lower down managers, I guess, or whoever. And they have big glass walls and people hang out in those offices and do lots of work and they have their, and it's nice to have your own office. They just don't have their own window, but they do have natural light because there's the big glass wall, there's open space, and then there's the window. And so you do kind of feel like there is a little bit of that natural light in those offices. And what you're basically talking about, if I get this right, is think of the bedrooms in your flexible co-living space a little bit like those interior offices in office buildings and just give them glass walls, give them natural light, but just don't give them natural light directly onto the perimeter of the building. Basically. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, I mean, really what we want to introduce is a lot more flexibility. So an architect could come into a space and say, okay, we're going to have some apartments that have exterior windows and others that don't. Maybe there's a, you know, sort of a suite of five single bedrooms all around a shared living room. And so some of them have exterior windows, some of them have interior windows. Everyone has access to natural light. But like you said, some of those bedrooms will sort of be similar or feel similar to those interior offices that you described. So that's a big cost savings because you don't need to dynamite out the core in the middle of the building. And you get to free up, you get to actually live in that square footage rather than having it as literal empty space in air. Yes. So that's a a huge savings. And then another advantage of all of this is that you can actually, with these smaller bedrooms, you can produce a lot more housing. So we worked with an architect who we took sort of a prototypical office floor plate and we said, okay, how many studio apartments could we fit on this floor plate? And it was, you know, 14 studio apartments. And we said, okay, what if we did flexible co-living? And it was more than double the number of studio apartments. So you have the potential to house a lot more people with this model, which is obviously good when you're trying to address a major housing crisis and and give people, you know, more more options and more diversity of options. There, There are over a million single adults in New York City. And many of them right now are either living on their own, but many more of them are living with other single adults as roommates and sharing multi-bedroom apartments that families in New York are desperate to get into, but they can't because we don't have enough housing for single adults. So we have we have a real need to kind of diversify the type of housing that we are offering the public. And it's what's somewhat crazy is that with the phasing out of SROs, we actually have fewer choices today as residents of New York City in terms of the type of housing we can access than people had, you know, in the mid 20th century. The other thing that's people have been talking about for many years is just the way in which family housing has been very sort of cookie cutter for many years in a way that families themselves have really not been. And especially among immigrant communities, you find a lot of multi-generational families. Is there a way in which this whole concept of um, office to residential conversions, for exactly the same reasons that they work for individuals just renting a single bedroom, can become, can create the kind of flexibility that you often find with like a family that has three generations living under one roof and random aunties sort of coming in and out and that kind of thing. That's an interesting idea. We, I haven't played with that all that much. I mean, in theory, it could work. I think if you had sort of a cluster of individual bedrooms around a living room, so people had a sense of like, we are all together and we're just sharing kitchens and bathrooms with other residents, but we have sort of our own living space. I I do think by and large, this is a model that will primarily appeal to people who are looking, you know, for their own place to live. I will say that whenever we've talked about this with academics, with real estate folks, with people in government, the initial assumption among most people is that this is a type of housing 
that would really exclusively appeal to young people, people who were sort of starting their careers. They want to come to New York or they want to stay in New York. And that, you know, when you're in your early 20s, you would find a setup like this to be appealing. But but we have also heard, not as many people, but we've definitely heard from several people who have said this type of housing could really work for seniors. You know, you could imagine a developer or a, a management company that says we're going to kind of create this housing and really market it to seniors. It could there could be a whole wonderful social component to it. It's a way for people to reduce their housing costs and kind of shrink their housing footprint. So I think there are a lot of different ways in which this model could appeal to kind of like different segments of New Yorkers. And again, this is not just New Yorkers because one of the major drivers, if not the major driver of the housing shortage in the United States right now. We have plenty of square footage existing per like human American, but you find across the country a bunch of boomers stuck in these enormous houses. Their kids have left, but they're still in them and they have unspeakable numbers of empty rooms and empty bedrooms. But there are lots of structural reasons why they don't downsize. And right now a lot of that is, you know, often related to mortgages and stuff like that. But also, it's just the the opportunity to be able to live somewhere as nice, you know, is that there aren't that many opportunities for them to go to. There's not, we don't have a real large amount of housing stock that people move to when they leave, you know, the, the family home where they raised their kids. And there's a, you know, this is what South Florida is famous for, but there's only one South Florida, and there's a lot of Americans. Right. Well, it's sort of and, – and we're seeing similar issues play out in New York where the housing market, by and large, because we have not had enough production to meet demand, it's it's incredibly stagnant, right? So you have families that are, in some cases – you know, maybe they uh, kids are off and now they're empty nesters who don't need to be in a three bedroom apartment, but they can't leave because they can't afford, you know, even downsizing would cost more than giving up their three bedroom, right? Because the economics are so crazy in the housing market. You have families that are stuck in apartments that are too small for them. They're desperate to leave. And oftentimes those families are saying, I, I want to stay in New York. I mean, I, I hear this all the time. I have two kids. Lots of our friends in New York are raising their children here. But for many people, at a certain point, they they want more space, they need more space, and they can't figure out how to make it work economically in New York. And so those families are up and leaving the city. And, you know, we're seeing that in our public school system here. We've seen a significant decrease in public school enrollment in New York. Um, we really need to have, I believe, uh, kind of a, a broad diversity of people across the board economically. We can't only become a city for sort of the ultra wealthy and the people who are the lowest income who who can't even afford to leave. I understand this concept in New York City. Talk to me a little bit about just more generally, though, like, is there a way in which this can work sort of mutatis mutandis in suburban office parks in Connecticut? It could. I'm not sure it would be quite as palatable, <laughs> uh, to be honest, in suburban office parks in Connecticut, in part because New Yorkers are accustomed, I think, by and large, to live in smaller spaces. We've all made trade-offs or bargains to be here. And I mean, if you've got an office park in Connecticut, you actually have plenty of space. Yes. Well, that's true. That you don't, that's it, true. It's the, well, I guess what I'm, you know, we know that there is a lot of commercial infrastructure in the suburbs that is now no longer fit for original purpose. And it would be great to be able to use that for residential because we have a housing crisis everywhere. Yes. I will say I know that in smaller cities, so this is less on, on the suburbs, that there are um, – I was speaking with a housing policy researcher at a national think tank that is looking at something very similar to flexible co-living, but in smaller cities around the country, like a, a Houston or let's say a Denver, cities All where- of our listeners in Houston are writing in right now. Did you just say Houston was smaller? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. That, that's, it's okay. We're New Yorkers. 
We can, we can, we, can, helps, we can. We're the one place in the country that can talk about Houston as quote smaller. Every, if it helps, I feel like everyone. Uh, yeah, that was probably a bad example. So <laughs> my know. apologies to all but, the Houston residents. Um, <laughs> the I just it, it's a um, they're looking at it in let's say cities that are not as large as New York because they think that model really could make a huge difference in some of those other cities around the country. So I think this is very much sort of on the table as we as a country and anyone who cares about kind of urban life and urban centers and the health of them is talking about and thinking about and um, trying to put new solutions on the table. I mean, just I think it was uh, recently the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof had a column about this company called Pad Split, where the idea it's sort of like Airbnb, but for rooming houses. So you take the the family that you described or the couple that are now empty nesters. They live in a big, sprawling five-bedroom house, but it's just two people. And through pad split, they can rent out individual bedrooms you know, by the week or by the month to, to people, but I, it's I believe, specifically I designed for... I believe in Victorian for... England, this was called taking in a lodger. Oh, yes, yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's that sort of, we're sort of looking to an old model that existed for, you know, for decades, not only in this country, but in others, um, that was largely phased out, but was a really effective way of housing people, especially lower income people. Quick break, and we'll be straight back. Slate Money is sponsored this week by SAP Business AI. We've got some bad news. It won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. It will identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. It will automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. It's basically something that allows you to get ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners. Whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.35% annual percentage yields when you open a savings account. A high yield, low effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. The one thing we do need to talk about, the really big advantage of converting buildings to residential that we haven't mentioned is this whole concept of embedded carbon and how it's just always much greener to convert an existing building than to demolish an existing building and build something new, even if the thing you build is like the world's most fantastic passive house. Right. That is 100 percent true. It's so much better from a construction standpoint the other sort of like icing on top is that most of these office buildings in in New York, obviously, but in other cities, too, are near public transportation. So you are also not only are you sort of um, reusing a piece of physical infrastructure that exists already, but you are also putting people in housing that is near public transportation, that is near jobs. And that has a, a really hugely positive benefit for the environment. And that I think in 
part is why we've we've seen recently the Biden administration uh, roll out a plan to help encourage these conversions across the country. They're putting, I think, billions of dollars into this effort, but it's designed to sort of spur these conversions. And they're certainly making the case that access to public transportation is one of the key reasons why they think this is so important, as well as the environmental benefits of not tearing down a building and starting from scratch. Because, yeah, the, that building, when it was constructed, was associated with enormous amounts of carbon emissions just because it's made out of concrete and concrete, you know, you have to heat up the cement to crazy temperatures. And there's lots of reasons why there's, it takes a lot of carbon to create concrete. But once you've created the concrete, the carbon's been emitted. The last thing you want to do is then just destroy all of that concrete and rebuild something new with new concrete. Come on, people. But it's not an economic argument, that one. It reminds me of every, um, I don't know, five years or so, people reinvent this idea of prefab houses. And they're like, prefab houses are a great way of creating lots of housing very quickly. And, and it's true, but it's also true that they never work out cheaper. And maybe maybe that's the point at which organizations like yours come in that a lot of this doesn't get done sort of automatically by the market and you do need government to come in and provide sort of tax incentives and that kind of stuff in order for people to make this happen. Right. I was about a week ago, Columbia Business School pulled together sort of a group of maybe 30 people who from academia, real estate, think tanks, advocacy groups to talk about conversions. And it was a, a really candid conversation that was had. It was, you know, sort of no press, kind of just exchange of ideas and brainstorming. But one of the things that we heard was um, banks are really reluctant to issue loans to developers for conversions, in part because there are so many unknowns that exist when you start renovating an existing building. It's like you you pull down the wall, you don't know quite what's behind the plaster and in the bowels of a building versus new construction is much more appealing. It's it's much more known. We know with greater certainty how much a project is going to cost, what the materials will cost, the timeline. We can game it out much more easily. So that's kind of like a a macroeconomic challenge that's sort of looming over all of this. And so uh, one of the conversations last week was around, you know, what needs to be done? Are there changes at the federal level that might need to take place to unlock some of that financing that would really be necessary to spur the growth and expansion of these conversions at a meaningful scale? Basically, some form of loan guarantee for the banks. Perhaps I don't. That's I. I don't. I don't want to recommend anything. Uh, <laughs> but but it's it was clear that that is a barrier that exists for these projects, and so if you know we we're going to have a problem if banks find new construction to be much more appealing as an investment versus a conversion, and how do we sort of square all of that? This is my opportunity to rant about the J.P. Morgan headquarters which, you know, was 270 Park Avenue, um, the tallest skyscraper in the world designed by a woman, Natalie Dubois, and recently had gone through a massive uh, retrofit, making it incredibly green and efficient. And then one day that neighborhood got rezoned and J.P. Morgan realized they were allowed to build higher there. And they have decided to demolish the whole thing and build a hideous new thing in its place. And they claim it's very green. But of course, it's not because they demolished a massive skyscraper to do it. And in fact, the square footage is not particularly bigger. The, the height is bigger, but the number of floors doesn't go up. It's just the floors are taller than they used to be. So boo here, J.P. Morgan. Stop investing in new construction, including on your own ridiculous white elephant of a headquarters and instead do smart things with the in existing stock. So I guess just to finish up, like you're very focused on New York, which is, has a bunch of idiosyncratic rules about like what years uh, buildings are allowed to be built in when, in before they can be converted and like all of this kind of weird stuff and where this comes from and the idiosyncrasies of, of, legislation in New York City and Albany and stuff, which we really do not need to get into. What I want to ask you is, 
Is that just a weird idiosyncratic New York thing? Or is that the kind of thing that you see basically everywhere across the United States where you want to do this kind of thing? Uh, New York is probably hands down the worst place. (laughs) It is a maze. There is a thicket of regulations in this city. And, you know, when you pull on one thread, there's some kind of rational explanation that you can dig up as to why a rule exists. Um, For the most part, not always. Some of them feel very haphazard. But New York, I think, is sort of has the highest regulatory hurdles that have to be cleared. So, you know, we talked about like the interior windows, for example, which currently are not allowed in New York for our flexible co-living pilot program that we want to move forward. You know, we're, we're calling for flexibility on window requirements. But Philadelphia and D.C. both allow interior windows. This is sort of like a non-event. There's no massive debate or outcry. This is just kind of they have this level of flexibility baked into their housing code. And I went and visited a former pantyhose factory in Philadelphia that was converted into apartments. So not dissimilar from an office and that it has like a deep, you know, factory floor plate. And they make ample use of interior windows. And when I toured around, I asked, you know, are these an issue? Do they get do you get questions about them? And they said, you know, we're renting these apartments. They're flying out of here. You know, we've practically leased this entire building. People love this. It's a cool space. They want to live here. So we have set up so many barriers to development, to housing creation, to innovation in New York. And big picture, we think given the scale of the challenges that we're facing on the housing front as well as the office vacancy front, we desperately need to innovate. We need to try new things. Let's pursue a pilot like this, see what works, get feedback from developers, from tenants, from residents. But we clearly need to be trying new housing models to meet this moment. And so we're we're certainly out there hoping and applauding efforts to kind of clear some of these regulatory hurdles. There are definitely multiple efforts underway at the city level, the state level, but uh, progress has unfortunately been pretty slow going in New York so far. It's almost as though making progress in housing in the United States is painful and slow. Who would have thunk? Grace Rao, thank you so much for coming on. This has been fantastic. Thank you for having me. I've loved it. And thanks to Jared Downing and Ben Richmond and all of the fabulous people here for producing. And we'll be back on Saturday with a regular sleep money. Advice Week is back at Slate. And we have a ton of exclusive content and exciting perks for Slate members. Subscribe now to unlock extra advice with weekly bonus segments of Dear Prudence. Plus, you'll get ad-free listening across all your favorite Slate podcasts. By joining, you're supporting Slate's independent journalism. Your membership matters. To subscribe now at our special Advice Week price, click Try Free at the top of your show page on Apple Podcasts. Or... Visit slate.com slash podcast plus.